Hello everybody and thank you for joining me again today. My name's Michael, I'm the minister at Hoonhei Presbyterian Church and this is the fifth message in the Salt Shaker series and the others are all online and you can check them out if you're interested and perhaps you've already been following through and I, if that is the case I thank you for taking time out in your schedule to follow through this teaching series with me. Today the topic is the church as lighthouse and safe harbour. The lighthouse and safe harbour are not strictly biblical metaphors but the idea of light shining in darkness begins in Genesis and is right throughout scripture. Paul's letters to the Corinthians, uh, the church there is to be a place of good and godly order and a place of ministry. So it's to be a safe harbour. Let's start the message by looking at the scriptures I've selected for today. The first one is from Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 to 7 and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Hope in the Messiah. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there'll be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms blood stained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. For unto us, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David and for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. And the second reading from the New Testament is from 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 to 7, also reading from the New Living Translation. Living in the light. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We're not practicing the truth. But if we're living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I think we'll all be familiar with the lighthouse and its purpose. It shines far out into the ocean and a ship's captain knows it will help him navigate safely into the harbour and help him and his ship to avoid rocks and other submerged obstacles. To do its job, however, the lighthouse often has to withstand the elements, which as shown here in this very dramatic photo, uh, the waves are pounding and unrelenting. At times, its own safety can be in jeopardy, let alone the ships that it seeks to help. And this is true of the Christian church also. Its divine mandate is to shine the light of Jesus Christ to the world but it is under constant attack from the tempestuous culture which surrounds it. This is very evident, I believe, in our era in Western culture. The church is really battered by the media and the assaulting winds of secularism and a general cultural hostility. If we could express it in a metaphor and a picture, 
I think this dramatic image of the lighthouse captures that situation very well. Every conscious human being is aware of physical light and darkness, and throughout Scripture, this physical reality is often used to teach about spiritual or unseen light and darkness. Here's just a few selected verses from the New Testament from the ESV. John 8:12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Ephesians 5, verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 1 John 1 verse 5, which we've also just read. This is the message that we've heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. And John 3.19, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. And not shown here is a favourite verse of mine from Psalm 36 verse 9, which says in part, In your light shall we see light. Everything takes on a different perspective when God's light is present. So what does light do? Light dispels darkness. That seems a fairly obvious point. But think about that spiritually. When God's light of revelation comes into our lives, into our hearts and minds, to our awareness, darkness uh, and confusion and fear are dispelled. The light makes a way or gives direction. Light often beckons us to come to its pathway. Everything else is dark, but here is a shaft of light that draws us in, gives us direction. The light reveals obstacles and or dangers. It exposes darkness and it snares. The light draws us, often an emotional sense. So if we light a candle in the darkness, it can trigger some very deep emotions for us. And it's interesting, isn't it, at a public display of grief, candles will often be lit when there is a public tragedy. Why? Because they just seem to draw us in. They give us pause for thought, to consider, to remember. And spiritually, they also show that there is light in the darkness. And the light provides hope. The light of the sun is the source of all life on earth for all plants. Because photos, in photosynthesis, that process, that chemical exchange that occurs, light energy is turned into food for plants. And of course, plants are the basis of entire food chains. So all life on earth depends upon the sun. The light provides hope. It's true to say that, quite frankly, without hope, we're stuffed. It's all darkness. The lighthouse is literally a ray of hope. And right at the start of scripture, we read in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis 1 verse 3, let there be light. And we think of physical light that later separates night and day, but that's true spiritually as well. The reformer John Calvin said that, said this of that verse in Genesis 1-3, he said, It was proper that the light, by means of which the world was to be adorned with such excellent beauty, 
should be first created. I think there he was referring to not just physical light, but also to spiritual light. Beyond the reach of the lighthouse's beam lies the open ocean, a deep, dark and scary place. There's not probably too many things that personally scare me, but a place like this certainly does. The restless waves and swells, which at any moment could be whipped up into a gale, and certainly looking at this image, that looks a very real possibility. Here there are no markers to provide direction. It's the same view from every direction, and there are no boundary or signposts. The Church of Jesus Christ has a divine mandate to shine the light of Christ into the dark ocean. But many people's circumstances and their life choices mean they end up in places like this spiritually, adrift in deep and dark waters. Sometimes it's due to destructive lifestyles and bad choices. Other times it could simply be through circumstance. And in fact, many people are not here by choice. But all of them, however they've ended up in a place like this spiritually, they're looking for the light. And it's our job as believers to be ambassadors for Christ in the dark and even in the scary places. Even closer to shore, the dangers remain. These are especially dangerous at night, uh, sorry, at high tide, because they can't be seen. The lighthouse, however, will shine its warning in both high and low tide. The church as a lighthouse will shine in all weathers and irrespective of the tides of culture. So we look at this scene here, and perhaps at high tide, many of those rocks would be covered and they would be a menace for any ship that dares to come close. Thinking of the tides of culture, the church here at Hoon Hay Presbyterian was established in 1959. And looking back over some of the records, there was some real excitement in the wider community about this church being established. The sign outside the hall read, Your Presbyterian Church, here soon! It was a proud and optimistic sign. But it's not like this now. It's not like this in this community. It's not like this in many communities where churches with such optimism sprung up in communities all around the country. Because the tide is very much out in our culture when it comes to Christian faith. The church and its activity and mission is now countercultural. But we'll keep the light of Christ shining in our communities because that's what we're called to do. Whether the tide's in or out, we keep being the church. Well, that's the church and the community and culture, but what about the welfare of those within the local church? We come to a church not because we're perfect, not because we're holier than thou in any sort of puritanical sense. We come as broken people. We come in our brokenness to encounter God and enjoy the fellowship of his people. We don't have it all together, even though sadly the stereotype in our culture is that we make ourselves appear to be perfect. And so that opens the door to charges of hypocrisy. So what are the rocks that dash faith? A very obvious one is doubt. The pounding waves of secularism are unrelenting and can so easily, we can easily doubt God's goodness and even his presence. I find comfort in the Psalms and books like Job where there is an outpouring, nothing is held back. The psalmist pours it all out before God and it's quite visceral, it's quite brutal in its honesty. 
There is absolutely no pretense in those psalms. There's an outpouring of problems, lots of rhetorical questions. And then as in Psalm 74, just for example, suddenly the psalmist turns his attention to God. Job got into this space too. His incredible suffering and all his friends around him didn't help. But when we start in those really hard places, including doubt, to actually focus on God, and it's not an easy thing to do, but we're reminded when we read Psalms like 70, Psalm 74 that if we can just lift our eyes, if we can get a bigger vision, a bigger vista, it really does help us. Another rock that dashes faith is discouragement. And to be perfectly honest, I can struggle with this one in ministry. We look around and we see what's happening in culture. We can see sometimes what's happening in our churches and it is so easy to be discouraged. Ministry today is hard work, spiritually speaking. Discouragement, it's one of the tools of the enemy. And it's a rock that can dash our faith. Again, the Psalms are instructive. There's Psalms of great discouragement, despair even. But when we can get it into a godly context, our situation it's that glimmer of hope. It's the lighthouse that shines into our hearts and minds. Another rock that can dash faith is pain. Seems obvious enough, I suppose. Physical pain that's unrelenting, that's sore, that's just sort of can lay us low. And emotional pain too. Loss and grief. Many people say, well, look, if God is all good, how come this or that happened to me? And the why question is just ever present. Sometimes we can't get an answer, but loss and grief can really impact our faith. Shame is the next one. I think shame is a very deep emotion. It strikes at the very core of our being. Shame is what occurred when sin first came into the world. The first human beings were aware of their nakedness. They had an awakening and shame was the result. And it's true for every one of us. We have the capacity at least to feel great shame and it can be a rock that dashes our faith. And as we age, fears in older age are rocks that can dash faith. Failing health, a loss of mobility, financial issues, loneliness, of course, the loss of a spouse or other loved one, the fears that surround a transition into a care facility, and the list could go on there. These are very real issues. Sometimes all we have to lay hold of is a sliver of light. The darkness is still there, but the light comes and with it comes hope. The church as lighthouse. Our foundation in the church is sure because Christ is our cornerstone. Ephesians 2.20, there is no other cornerstone. This is one of those things that differentiates the Christian church from any other organisation or institution. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Being the body of Christ, we gather as the redeemed community of God for worship, for teaching, for ministering, to each other near and far, for discipling, for fellowship. And when the church works and works well, there is a modelling of godly relationships and really importantly to forgiveness. Matthew chapter 18 and verses 15 to 20 tells us how we should sort out a disagreement. And those words, like so much of scripture, it's really easy to read but how do we put it into practice? It takes courage. It takes character 
to go to people and sort things out. But that's what we're called to do. This is the distinctive uh, relationships within the functioning community of faith. And of course, forgiveness is so foundational, isn't it? When we hang on to things, we get septic, it screws us up inside, and we are not able to function as God intends. So forgiveness, which is modelled in the life and ministry and death of the Lord Jesus Christ, is so important. But once again, easy to say, easy to talk about, when hurts and wounds are very deep, it's hard to forgive, and we need God's strength. The church's lighthouse, it's a beacon of hope shining into the dark waters of confusion and despair in our community. The church's lighthouse practices the truth. There's a very active sense here, the doing, the verb. The reading we had earlier, 1 John 1 verse 6, practice the truth. It's not just about talk. That would be hypocritical. It's about doing. The church as the lighthouse is able to stand or withstand the pressures that come its way, like that picture we saw earlier of the lighthouse being battered by those incredible waves. That's true for us as individual believers, and it's true for us as a community of believers. Ephesians 6.13 is the armour of God passage, and we appropriate in God's strength various defensive weapons and very various offensive weapons, but then we have to stand or we'll hold the ground. The lighthouse stands in all weathers and all seasons and endures, as does the church. The church is safe harbour. The lighthouse warns about rocks and other obstacles like sandbars. But the Christian church is a safe harbour. It warns about sin, its consequences and judgment. It warns, teaches, instructs and, plays, uh, and prays. It should be a safe place where these things are dealt with. The church needs to be a safe place to be vulnerable. Now this doesn't just happen, of course, because it's premised, relationships like this are premised on trust that is earned and respected. When there's confession and prayer for healing, James 5.16 talks about the prayer of a righteous person avails much Confession is the gateway to healing. But being vulnerable like that carries with it a great risk because we have to trust other people. And so our relationships have to be right. We must deal with those relational issues. But it's hard. It's hard. Churches can be places that hurt people just like anywhere else, in fact, in some ways worse than other places, sadly. Where there's gossip, backbiting, and a party spirit, factions, and sin that's not dealt with and so forth, churches can sadly at times become toxic places. And how do we deal with that? Well, Paul wrote to churches like that at Corinth and, uh, and other places and his message was really sort this out. You cannot be authentic people for Christ if there's this sort of stuff going on. And uh, he, he uh, names all sorts of issues in his letters, his two letters to the Corinthians. Well, we have to sort stuff out too, because if we don't, our churches are not going to be a safe place to be vulnerable. The church is a safe harbour, is a place to just be we live in a world of busyness and movement and doing, but the church is a safe harbour. There's many things, but it has to be just a place to be, to encounter God and enjoy fellowship, sharing and working together. Yes, churches have to be places of doing, but first and foremost, 
we're, we're being together and worshipping together. That is the gathered community of God and it should be a safe place. And when it is, it's a really attractive place, shining the light into those deep dark waters in our communities. John 3.19 says that people love darkness rather than light. And when I read scriptures like that, I think of the slater or wood lice. They're actually called different names in different parts of the world, but I remember them as slaters. Um, and the definition of a slater or wood lice is a primitive, multi-segmented, multi-legged isopod crustacean. <laughs> Quite a mouthful there. Um, they look sort of primitive, don't they, really? And these little creatures like darkness. If you turn over an old rotting stump and they're there, they'll quickly scurry away back into the darkness. And many people live their lives like that. Some people don't know how to get out of the darkness, those deep waters that we looked at in that slide a few moments ago. How do people get out of deep water and darkness? Well, if they make choices like the Slater to scurry away back into the darkness, there's not much hope. But people in the church, Ephesians 5.8, are to walk as children of light. We are to love the light spiritually, not the darkness. Don't be a Slater. I like this slide and I've used it often in these messages because it shows different people together, ordinary people from all walks of life, all ages, ethnicities and backgrounds. This is what God's people look like. God's workers in the local church, people who should be living in the light and equipped in the church for the work of the ministry to go into dark places and be the light, be lighthouses. I'm sure there's a lot more in the metaphors of lighthouse, lighthouse and safe harbour, but we'll leave it there for today. So I thank you once again for taking time to listen to this message and I hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you in some way. The next message in the series I want to look at when church is hard. So that will be next time. Meanwhile, take care and God bless.